That's pretty good. Thank you. I think in in order to have um, a good civil society, you need norms that are that are well structured and, and agreed to by most folks. One of the things that has really changed in our culture is the family, the breakdown of the core family. And I think that the impact of that is huge. And you talk about acting as adults and making adult decisions. It's the family that gives you that kind of structure from the beginning. And we're in disarray in that sphere, in my opinion. And I just wonder if you could say a few words about the family and what, where we're going and what we might do. I think it's a really um, fundamental truth, actually, um, that family matters. And, uh, and, and this is itself one of these ideas that um, uh, has gotten polarized and politicized in a way where if you talk about family, you must be coming from a conservative perspective. Um, uh, and if you defend the idea of family, you must be, um, you know, anti-progress. Um, I, I, I would agree, but amend, uh, or, or not even amend, uh, append, um, and simply say, yes, f family, having a stable structure of caring adults around you as a, as a young person um, is foundational um, in your formation, um, your, your civic formation, your ethical formation, um, your, your social formation. Um, what I would simply add is that what that looks like um, is, you know, is multivaried. Um, what that looks like may not be um, the Leave it to Beaver family of, uh, of lore. Um, it may be very, you know, uh, I, I, I have a family where I have a, my, I have a daughter and a stepdaughter. Um, and uh, both my wife and I, um, each having come out of a first failed marriage, um, learned lessons from that first failed marriage and have built uh, a family ecosystem uh, now um, that is quite about what you're describing, right? Um, uh, when I, we spoke a lot about marriage equality. Um, you know, to, to me, one of, the, <laughs> one of the most kind of powerful cases that you can make for uh, gay marriage was that these were, these were adults who wanted to commit not only to each other, but to raising children in many cases in a, a continuous, uh, a stable uh, household, right? Uh, and to me, um, th th that's wonderfully conservative um, in, in the best way. There's something worth conserving there, right? Even though the means of doing it might seem to many people uh, to, be, to, to be not conservative, right? Uh, so I think that, look, m among the many influences that I have in my uh, civic identity are some of the folks that we've talked about, whether it's a King or a, or a Lincoln or uh, you know Madison or whatever. Uh, but I'm Chinese American. I'm, I'm the son of Ch immigrants from China, uh, and so I'm Confucian. Uh, and every ethic of Confucian identity tells you that um, you know your your sense of values and your moral integrity radiates out from self to family, um, and from family to society. But fa the the ring of family is. Uh, is central there, right? Um, I think in American life today, um, you know, I have a good friend named Mia Birdsong who um, runs a, an organization called the Family uh, Story Project. Um, and she's been trying to reclaim the story about African American families, and particularly African American men. Um, and she is just documenting story after story of great black fathers. Just, you know, kind of recognize it. That's all she's doing, right? And she's not even kind of pre prefacing it with any political statement. She's just recognizing that we have this dominant narrative in American life that black families are broken um, and that they're broken because black men are not showing up for their families, right? Um, and she's both trying to counter that narrative but also uh, give to many of the uh, young black men out there who are making choices in their lives right now concrete exemplars and models uh, of how to be and how to show up in, in, in life in ways that um, uh, are going to be good for everybody. Hi, my name is Kevin Cow. I am a fourth year at EVA. Um, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today, Mr. Liu. Um, today we spoke um, about uh, slavery by another name and um, Jackson Parish, Louisiana, and other examples of um, political organization um, among um, groups that some consider uh, marginalized. And my question is, how would you suggest or approach um, 
organizing marginalized groups, um, you know, those that are less inclined to organize politically um, or engage in the political system um, to leverage their citizen power and, their, and, and engage civically? Um, well, I think it, it, though it depends certainly on the particular group that you might be thinking about, um, I, I think there are some uh, universals that, um, uh, you know, t to me, getting folks involved in civic participation and exercising civic power uh, cannot be a message of eat your vegetables, do your duty, right? That'll move some people, it'll actually probably move me, but you know, um, uh, but it won't move enough people, right? Um, I, I think rather than eat your vegetables or do your duty, the message has to be join the club, join the party, join the community, right? What you've got to tap into is what are people yearning for in terms of a sense of purpose, right? How do they define purpose? Um, again, uh, C Cousin Ricky and other folks like my relatives in Louisiana who started going to Trump rallies as their first ever form of civic participation um, d did so because they, they felt like they were joining a club. They were joining a party and a community of purpose, right? Their sense of purpose is complicated as we were unpacking uh, there, but, uh, but they have this common bond of I'm not, this is gonna help me feel not alone. This is gonna help me feel like my voice is amplified, right? Um, and I think that's, um, uh, th that's really key right now. Um, so if you think today about different marginalized groups, it, it, well, let's think specifically about disfavored groups under this administration. You think about undocumented immigrants, right? Undocumented immigrants, um, even bef well before uh, Donald Trump became president, um, had uh, particularly the, the younger cohort of them, so-called dreamers, um, uh, ha have been incredibly effective uh, over the last half decade plus um, at organizing around this common sense of purpose, right? Um, not because, uh, now, yes, there was a sense of threat uh, that it behooved them to organize so that they could help um, apply pressure for comprehensive and sane immigration reform in the country. Um, but even beyond that, it was a sense of, I'm not alone, right? Um, somebody who I write about in the book, a friend named Jose Antonio Vargas, who's a, a, another Pulitzer winner, a journalist, um, uh, came out a few years ago as undocumented, right, in the New York Times Magazine cover story. Uh, and he said, I've been keeping this a secret for decades uh, since I found out in high school that I, that I wasn't born here, but that I was, I, I was uh, undocumented, and that I wasn't a citizen, but I was undocumented. That when he came out, it set off this great cascade uh, of lots of other people um, who've been undocumented, who felt like they had to live in the shadows, even though this is the only country they've effectively known, uh, and certainly the country that they want to contribute to and be a part of, right? Um, it, it, it encouraged them, it literally gave them courage to step forward uh, and name themselves, right? They put themselves at risk of deportation, uh, but by doing that and doing that in the company of others, they began to realize, I'm not alone, I have a community here, right? Um, and I think tapping that yearning to be not alone um, is really um, central, even before you get to the particulars of, you know, your specific group's cause. Curious about, uh, you were born in China. No, I was born in the United States. In the United States? Yeah. You were. Okay, but you probably know a lot about Chinese history. Uh, what happened in China so far as uh, the involvement of Chiang Kai-shek? And I'm curious about this, and when uh, Mao Zedong came along, what happened to all the statues? Uh, so I, I, I do want to name, name an interesting um, premise uh, uh, of the question here. Um, uh, how many people in this room are sons or daughters of immigrants? Where, where from? Where, 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 are your, where were your parents from? Poland. Poland. Um, do you know a lot about Poland? I know a lot about the uh, the organization of the world that is Franz Joseph, the, the whole difference. So when you asked me the question, I hesitated mm. because it's now the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and to them, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Poland. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, yeah. uh, it's, it's not a simple question. Yeah, I, I, I asked this, someone else was a, yeah, what about you, where are you from? Yeah, Vietnam. And how much do you know about Vietnam? Um, very basic. Right. That is a good, you're saying that you really don't know. 
Well, no, I actually actually do know a fair amount about uh, about China and, and, and specifically about your question. But I think it's important to recognize this full spectrum from very basic to little, uh, all the way to you know the difference between you know the Austro-Hungarian Empire to what's now Ukraine to you know all these things. Different people will have different levels um, of knowledge of their parents' homeland, right? Um, and I think, and I name this because what what separates me as an Asian American. And a son of Asian immigrants from, say, you as a, as a descendant of European immigrants um, is that it is still the fact in 2017 that in uh, the United States, um, it, it, too often Asian Americans are presumed foreign until proven otherwise, right? Um, and that presumption sometimes is just a cocktail party kind of, you know, speed bump to kind of get over, uh, but other times uh, as in times of fear or nativism, um, feeds a kind of uh, yellow peril um, thing where suddenly, um, you know, I, anyway, so I, I want to name that because I think one of the most important things um, when I'm out there talking about American identity, American citizenship, I'm doing so as a Chinese American. Um, and, uh, and part of my responsibility in doing that is to name to audiences like this, um, this reality that um, for lots and lots of Asian Americans, um, we will encounter situations where we're presumed foreign until proven otherwise. And I want to invite you to flip those presumptions. Now, to, to your question, um, uh, I, I know a lot about this because my, um, so my, my parents were born in China. My father um, was this, my, my father's father uh, grew up in Hunan province. He was the son of a farmer. Um, uh, and he was given the name Liu Guoyun. And if you speak Mandarin, Liu is my family name. Guoyun means basically deliverance of the nation. Right? So no pressure, right? Just uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the son of, son of a farmer gets called, son of a farmer gets called uh, deliverance of the nation. Um, and he indeed ended up um, just timing, coming of age as um, the age of dynasties ended and the Republic of China was formed. Um, and so um, uh, when he was a teenager and into his 20s, um, he joined the uh, military of the Republic, the fledgling Republic of China. He became a pilot. And over the years, he became uh, head of the Air Force of the Republic of China, um, the nationalist Chinese, right? Uh, and so he... Um, the non -com just to be non-communist. Non-communist. Chiang kai So, he, uh, so my family, um, my grandfather w had a very active hand in helping Chiang Kai-shek fight um, Mao and the communists. And um, I never met this grandfather. Um, I just grew up with le le family legends of him. Um, you talk about the ways in which families shape you, not just kind of in living ways, but kind of the, the legacy of, you know, what am I going to do to deliver my nation, right? That, that kind of uh, tr feeling of you better, you better live up to that. Um, but I think the, the, the long and short of it uh, on Chiang Kai-shek and Mao was uh, um, uh, Mao, uh, the, the, though, though my relatives who are still, um, and my uncles who are very loyal nationalists still, um, uh, who, it's interesting, they all came to the U.S., studied here, worked here in the 70s and 80s. Several of them basically hit glass ceilings um, in their workplaces, whether it's universities or um, IBM or Bell Labs or whatever, and one by one in the 80s, they started going back to Taiwan because Taiwan was saying, hey, we're one of the new Asian tigers. We're booming. You got a lot more opportunity. Come back. And they went back, <clears throat> and they found way more opportunity um, uh, in, in Taiwan. People who had been blocked here um, ended up becoming leaders in, in civic society there. Um, and, and, uh, and so they're very loyal nationalists, but I, I would tell you that they lost. The nationalists lost. They had to flee to Taiwan uh, be, be, for two reasons. I mean, one, Chiang Kai-shek was corrupt. The nationalists were corrupt. Um, and number two, um, Mao practiced some of the strategies that I talked about in this book. Mao knew how to mobilize actual bottom-up people power. He knew how to tap into the yearnings for purpose, the yearnings for community, the yearnings to be seen, heard, and recognized of people in the countryside. Um, and, uh, you know, no amount of propping up by the U.S. could help the uh, uh, nationalists survive. And I think that uh, 
Um, that, that itself, uh, I, I write about it in passing here, one of the strategies of civic power is what I call guerrilla citizenship. Like how do you, um, in, in bottom-up ways, kind of uh, avoid frontal attack um, you know, uh, 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 of your opponent, uh, but find all these different ways to subvert, sabotage, undermine, um, and uh, Mao was a master at that. Um, Charlie, was your question um, uh, also, were you looking for some parallel to the debate in the United States now um, and in the city of Charlottesville? You may not know this detail, though it's made some national news. Uh, there's a park in downtown Charlottesville uh, called Lee Park, uh, or is it Lee and Jackson Park, but uh, that has an enormous... Lee, just Lee Park. Yeah, there's a separate park called Jackson Park, um, and uh, and there's an enormous statue of uh, Robert E. Lee uh, mounted uh, on horseback uh, that has been there since the 1920s, right? Thereabouts, yeah. Uh, and the uh, and so as part of this larger debate uh, about Confederate monuments and, and such, uh, that's been a very big issue. Well, no, no, but uh, but uh, actually, but I think your answer actually uh, does relate in some interesting ways. Um, and so now the, the city council of, of Charlottesville has voted, very divided vote, three to two, uh, to remove the statue uh, at the behest of, uh, uh, of a very active citizens, a mobilization of citizens. And there are obviously some citizens who are very opposed to that. Uh, and, the, and just, I think, yesterday, uh, the city council uh, voted to, by, again, by three to two, to sell the statue, essentially, to, the, to, it's available for sale. Uh, but that whoever buys it has to remove it as well. Um, uh, that, that's sort of the idea, and to re, and to change the names. Mm -hmm. They voted unanimously, interesting enough, uh, to change the name of the park. Uh, it won't be Lee Park or Jackson Park anymore, though. I'm not. Sure. Did they designate names? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. But they're going to change it. But it does. Uh, it does raise this. Um, it does get an interesting right. question, you know, of that because the the erection of that statue was an expression of the political will of the people uh, at the time that statue w was erected. It certainly was acceded to by the people, uh, even though I think a particular person paid for it and, and gifted it to the city. Um, and the, but all across the country, you know, the, all across the South, there are these monuments uh, that were very much so uh, legitimate expressions of a part, the, of the most powerful part uh, of the citizenry at the time. Uh, and so now here we are, it's a you know, radically different time, uh, and, and, but a lot of division about what do those things represent? Are they just historic? Uh, are they, uh, I make the point, Charlie, and I may have slightly different views uh, on this, but uh, the point that I make oftentimes is that you know, every time a city employee or a county employee goes out to the Confederate monument in front of the courthouse, uh, which has a carved Confederate battle flag in, as part of the monument, this is a different monument, but it's just a block away. Um, but every time a worker goes out there with a leaf blower and blows the leaves away from the base of the monument um, or any other act of maintenance of any sort, uh, that is that is a re-expression of the uh, of the the people through our government uh, to maintain and preserve that monument, and so it's a re-expression of whatever that monument says. Um, and so it's not a purely clinical question uh, of that. Oh, it's just been there a long time, and it ought to just get to sit there. In my view, at least, it's it's a legitimate question to say: Do we want to continue to say what these monuments say? On the other hand, it's just history, and I think probably the interesting point Charlie was trying to make, I think, was that uh, here you have this a struggle in China that uh, and that where many people, your family would have perceived as the bad guys, won the struggle. Uh, did they then erase erase all of the representations of what had been there before? I think we think yes, and you know uh, the answer to that. And we generally would say that was a bad thing uh, to, to have erased what was erased um, uh, that had been there before. And so, I th and so it is an interesting parallel to try to raise and also gets into this will of the people um, uh, question. You know, one of the things that's uh, interesting about the, um, the Charlottesville situation, um, so, so I'm, I'm quite uh, with, with, with you, Doug, um, and uh, uh, I think actually all across the South, um, we need to stop tinkering around the edges. I think part, part of being, you know, uh, the, the, the South is part of the Union, and uh, and and so I, I, I see no need for homage to the Confederacy. Um, uh, I think there can be museums where these objects, these battle flags, and these uh, things are displayed and uh, explained, and uh, and it's understood that uh, this is uh, not only a part of the past but a central part of the identity uh, of this part of the country. 
Um, but um, I actually think it's, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Yale alum. I'm very active still in Yale, and, and some of you may have followed that Yale College um, o over the last bunch of years had a big running debate about whether to rename one of the residential colleges uh, Calhoun College, right? Um, and I was firmly of the camp that, uh, um, you know, it was time to change. Uh, and there were others who were like, look, I get it, but um, if you change it, then you're just sweeping it under the, you know, under the rug and, um, uh, and you're denying history. And I'm like, no, no. Uh, I, I think you can have, as they will have, a display um, in now what's called Grace Hopper College, um, named after a, a Yale alumna. Um, who was the uh, first uh, woman to be admiral, an admiral in the United States Navy and a pioneer in uh, computer science. Uh, um, uh, you can have in the, in the kind of common room of Grace Hopper College um, a great display um, about what this place used to be called and why it was called that and what the debate was about that and, um, and why it was for many years that John C. Calhoun from the class of 1804 or whatever it was, um, was, was respected. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, as far as um, China and Taiwan, um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, M Mao not only got rid of any, you know, homage to nationalism, but because Mao ended up going mega mega megalomaniacal um, and seeding the Cultural Revolution, they started tearing down everything, right? Um, one of the great things uh, that the Nationalist Chinese did in 1949 when they were on the verge of defeat and they were uh, beginning to flee the mainland to retreat to Taiwan, um, uh, and this is a this is great not just kind of for team nationalists. This is great for civilization and humanity. Um, they went to the Forbidden City and they boxed up all the treasures of Chinese history and Chinese civilization, and they shipped that stuff to Taiwan. Uh, they shipped it and they flew it there. And so, uh, had they not done that, that is precisely the stuff that uh, the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution would have smashed to bits, right? Mm -hmm. But if you now go to the National Palace Museum in Taipei, um, you see the entire kind of basically the greatest hits of Chinese civilization. Um, and, um, and so I would argue that they did a better job of preserving um, the, the, the history and the kind of artifacts uh, um, than, in, than, than the, quote, victors. Yeah, yeah, well, what a, uh, it's a fascinating and complicated question. I was wondering about your opinion about teaching civics, which we don't do anymore in school. And in other words, teaching citizenship, really, how to be a citizen of this country. No one knows it anymore. Yeah, I agree totally. Um, civics has been squeezed out of the curriculum in a lot of schools uh, over the last couple of decades. And, um, you know, and our politics are the consequence of that, right? Um, uh, the, this is, un, unfortunately, because we have such a decentralized system of public education in this country, th th there's no magic wand uh, that Congress can, there's no law that Congress can pass to uh, remedy this. This is um, not even at the level of the state legislature. Um, you know, district by district, uh, people have to make a recommitment uh, to civics um, and I think, again, that's an opportunity for folks bottom up to start saying, hey, um, you know, and I think the, what gives me a belief that it is possible is precisely the reason why civics was squeezed out over the last two, three decades, which is um, a concerted push uh, by tech and business and, uh, and industry um, to emphasize STEM education, science, technology, uh, and, and mathematics, right? Uh, engineering and mathematics. And, um, and a, a big STEM push has now uh, dominated uh, public education. Look, I'm all for STEM, but um, uh, mainly I bring this up to say that it's possible if people organize uh, and organize with, uh, um, with, with loud voices and people behind them uh, to push our school boards and our state boards of education um, to recenter civics. I agree very much. Uh, but by the way, um, uh, former Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice, um, in her retirement has launched a great project that I would encourage you to tell the young people in your lives about called iCivics.org. And it's a, uh, an online platform of video games aimed at middle schoolers and high schoolers um, that teach civics through, through gaming. Um, and it's quite sophisticated and it's very, um, it's not eat your vegetables civics, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's uh, creative and, uh, and engaging. 
I'm pretty like sure. you, I'm no oh, fan okay. of President Trump, but I, for I'm my fine. own sanity, I sort of... She says um, she's no fan of President Trump. Um, chose to decide that he is catalytic for change, to save my own sanity. To, this week, he is announcing that he has a new slogan. He's great on those. And it's, buy American, hire American. And he's put a bill out there. I don't know what will happen. Can you comment on that? Um, so it, it is, um, it, it's not a, uh, it, I, I believe it's an executive order and not a bill. Um, and I believe that it is um, a measure of um, how quickly, the, hundred, the first hundred days are not even up yet, right. how quickly he is realizing the limits of his power. Um, he, 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 re, he is realizing um, both because of citizen resistance and because of his, let's, let's put it charitably, his inexperience in dealing with a Congress, um, that he's unlikely to be able to move much of any substance um, uh, legislatively. Um, and so um, he, is, he is falling back in the first hundred days to what many presidents fall back to when they're a lame duck in their last hundred days, which is issuing kind of symbolic executive orders. Um, and that's essentially what this is. Um, uh, it, it may have some effect in terms of federal uh, contracting hiring. I haven't read the, the executive order, but, um, uh, but, but in, in saying this, I don't mean to be wholly dismissive because one of the, one of the, I wouldn't say geniuses, but one of the deep insights that Donald Trump has had in his time as a national political figure um, is that symbols matter. Symbols do matter. Right, uh, Hillary Clinton thought that, you know, if you come out with a 20-point policy plan, um, and show people how much homework you've done, um, that uh, they'll give you the keys, right? Um, and what Donald Trump reminds you is that leadership is about symbols in many cases. Leadership is about finding the signal story, the signal slogan, the signal proposal that embodies a set of values a certain way. Um, that people, particularly people who haven't had civics education and aren't particularly sophisticated about stuff, uh, will, will grab onto and say, yeah, yeah, he's, that, that's, what I, that's the kind of thing that I wanted, right? Uh, so someone like me who has too much sophistication about how government works will look at that executive order and just roll my eyes, right? Uh, but I think a large swath of Americans will say, yep, that's what we hired him to do, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, uh, and, and he knows that. Eric has to do a radio interview in a couple of hours, and I think we need to let his voice start healing. So um, uh, let's stop there. But thank you so much. It was really terrific. Really